Okay, so well, let's start. Um, okay, so so I, I want to go back a little bit to something we said last time because I got a few questions on this, on, on boosting, which is also part of your homework. So um, wasn't clear to me wasn't uh, why it wasn't clear. But, but really, the algorithm is very simple. I mean, so there is a little bit of math to, to show that the algorithm uh, works. But really, the algorithm itself is basically what's written here. It's, it's a, you choose t, which is the number of rounds. In every round, you construct a distribution that we denote a dt. You find a weak hypothesis, and we don't tell you how to find a weak hypothesis. We just assume that you can. Uh, this is denoted HT. You compute the error of this weak hypothesis, epsilon t. You know that it's, the error is less than half because it's a weak hypothesis. And you do this t times. Every time you compute uh, the epsilon, find, uh, update the distribution as a function of it and keep on going t times, and then at the end, you, com you, you compute your final hypothesis. So, so that's the algorithm. And the details of how to compute the distribution are given here. We start with, with a uniform distribution, and then construct it this way. And again, it's, it's a really a very simple uh, computation. Uh, all you need to know is, um, one, how to compute the alpha which is given here as a function of epsilon, the error, and how to compute zt, which is basically a normalization factor. So you can either use the formula that is shown a little bit later, or you can just normalize. Uh, it's the same thing. So, so really, it's a very, very simple algorithm. And once you're done with this, you compute the final hypothesis this way. So as I said, the algorithm is very simple. I spend a little bit of time trying to explain why it works, which is also relatively simple given the power of this algorithm. So these are just explanation of why the algorithm makes sense. The fact that it reduces the weight of those examples that you got right 
and increases the weight of those examples you got wrong so that you focus, you force your weak learner to focus on these examples. And then we, we played with uh, some justification where really the key thing that I want to make sure that you understand is this part, uh, which basically writes errors in different ways. And, and it's good for you to understand what is the meaning of error. I assume by now you already understand this, but this really emphasizes this again and, and shows that error is really something that depends on the distribution uh, from which the data is sampled. Questions on this? So the, the number of examples is given to you. What you change is the distribution over these examples. So if you think about the input to your algorithm as sampling from your, dis, from your set of M examples, you use the same set of M examples every time, only that you sample given a different distribution. So, so at the beginning you sample with a uniform distribution, and later on, uh, you have a different distribution and you sample according to it. So your algorithm could see different examples and most importantly, the way you compute error is now different. Because error is the weighted sum over the examples uh, that you got wrong and the weights are different. But you have a fixed set of examples. Other questions? Okay, so that, that was uh, that was other boost, and at the end of last time we moved to talk about multi-class classification. So let's see uh, where we left off. So there are several ways to think about multi-class classification, and the first one, the simplest one, and, and really the most commonly used one. Uh, is, is the one that we call one versus all. Where basically you think about having these three class labels um, and you decompose into three binary problems. Black versus everything, blue versus everything, green versus everything. So the assumption that we are making here is that this is possible, that each one of the examples that belong to a given label is separable from the union of all the others. And I pointed out that this not, is not always the case. The red examples here show this. Um, but nevertheless, that's, that's, that's the paradigm. Uh, not going to work uh, in the case of, of, of red. Um, so really, there's no theoretical justification. It's just an assumption. And this assumption kind of tend to hold when you're working in a very, very high dimensional space. Not always though. So we're gonna see some approaches that do not need to make these assumptions. Uh, but basically that's what we are doing, right? So we are, in the case of um, the four colors that I have here, red, blue, green, yellow, we are learning four different weight vectors that I'm denoting here, VR, VB, VG, VY. And, uh, we, and we are assuming that um, VB dot product X is positive if and only if Y is blue. Uh, so that's basically the way we learn. And then we classify using this argmax. So once you've learned all these VIs, you classify by computing on a given point X, VI dot product with X, and doing argmax over I. Um, okay, and, and we pointed out uh, this problem. Uh, notice that your hypothesis space here, if you have n dimensions and k labels, you can think about your hypothesis space here as a vector in r n to the k, r, r to the n k, right? Because you have n dimensions for each one of the v vectors, and you have k vectors. Um, okay, so, so that. That made an assumption, and then we moved to think about, uh, in the real end, about the fact that 
it's too strong an assumption. Let's see if we can do something else. And the something else that we proposed is to think about, well, if we are talking about K labels, and it's a well-defined problem, each pair of them has to be separable. And therefore, instead of assuming that each label is separable from the union of the others, we're just going to make the assumption that each pair is separable and learn this way. And this is called all versus all, or all pairs. Uh, and basically, we decompose the learning now instead of two K different classifiers, binary classifier, into K choose two binary classifiers. So we're looking at labels I and J. And the IJ classifier is going to take positive examples that are labeled I, negative examples that are labeled J, and we're going to learn this way. Um, so uh, learning is as easy. Basically, learn binary classifier. But the decision at the end is more involved. So again, in the perfect world, uh, you can just uh, take an example run all k square classifiers that you learned earlier on this example and see who wins. So only the true label should win in all cases. Right? Only the one that really x belongs to should win in all cases. But of course, this may not be the case uh, in real life. So people are trying to do other things. So let's just, before we get to this, just let, let's look at how this uh, looks. So, so the corresponding to what I showed before, in this case I have, again, the weight vectors, I'm calling them Vs. Uh, and I'm, in this case, the index is two characters. So it's V, red, blue, V, red, green, and so on. Um, and this, this is a classifier whose role is to just distinguish between red and blue. Uh, the picture looks quite complicated because I need to separate. I have many hyperplanes here, and they separate colors. The dimensionality here is r to the n times k square, because again, each vector is n dimensions, and I have k square of this. And the question is how to classify. And you can, again, think about this scheme. You can either do majority. Or you can do a tournament, where really in the tournament here, the arrows should go up rather than down. But in tournament, you can just assume that you start with, you're given an example. Uh, you run on n over 2 of your models, say 1 and 2, 3 and 4, 5 and 6, and so on. You get a winner from each one of these n over 2 classifiers. And then you pair them again. And you keep on going up until you get to the winner. Um, of course, there could be some weird stuff. So one, one interesting issue here that could cause problems when you evaluate it here um, is what are you training these examples on? So example that belongs to the red uh, label is observed by some of the classifiers, but not all the classifiers, right, when you train. What classifiers see red examples here? Only those that separate red from something. So really, only k minus 1 classifiers out of the k square that we have, see red examples in training, right? <laughs> Only red versus blue, red versus green, uh, whatever we have here. Uh, but the blue versus green in training never sees a red example, right? On the other hand, in test, you don't know which classifier to run. You get an example. You have no idea which label it belongs to. In principle, you're going to run all the classifiers on it. Who knows if a classifier that was trained only on red and green examples, who knows what it will do with red examples? Could make mistakes. Could claim it 
to be green. So, so that's why this, basically the, the principle of train uh, on a given distribution and test on the same type of distribution is broken here. And this could cause some weird stuff. But basically, with the hope that this doesn't happen and your classifier behave sensibly, this is a good approach. So let's just summarize so that we'll see these two approaches one uh, against the other. So, so I'm assuming that I have M examples. I'm assuming that I have K class labels. And let's assume for simplicity that it's uniformly split. So I have M over K examples <coughs> belonging to each class label. So the first method, one versus all, the classifiers that I'm training, I'm training this way. Uh, I have for Fi, I ranges here from one to K. I have M over K uh, examples that are positive and all the rest are negative. And I have this K times. And the decision is basically I'm taking my K linear classifiers and I'm doing one the winner takes all, argmax. Second model, all versus all, each classifier is now indexed by two labels, F, I, J, and each classifier sees M over K positive example for I, M over K negative example, those that belong to J. So it's more expressive, as we said. However, I'm training with less examples. Right, so before every classifier saw all the M examples, here each classifier just sees two M over K examples. Um, and then I have K square uh, linear classifiers and I have to do uh, to make a decision. Okay, so, um, so which one is better? Uh, or uh, which one should you prefer? So expressivity-wise, it's clear that all versus all seems better. Uh, Efficiency-wise, it seems that one versus all is better because all you have is K classifiers as opposed to K square. But in fact, if you think a little bit more carefully about it, it's not always this case. So I want you to think a little bit about this dual primal point that we made when we talked about SVNs and, and dual perceptron, kernel perceptron. What was the issue there? What, we, we made some distinctions between efficiency of training when we are in the primal versus when we are in the dual. Anyone remembers? So let's think perceptron. So if you run perceptron in the primal, what are you doing? You get uh, an example, you compute the dot product with your weight vector, and that's it, right? So each example, you basically do an operation of dimensionality n. What do you do if you run in the Right, why? Right, so let's, let's just recover this. So in the primal, as we said, in order to evaluate my model on example X, all I need to do is to compute the dot product with the, the, the weight vector. That's it. So it's one dot product of size n. If I'm in the dual, what do I have to do to compute the prediction on X? Yeah? Yeah, so let's assume half the examples that we've seen before. Order of magnitude, all the examples. And I have to compute dot product with all of them. So if I have M examples, now I have to do M times N operations in order to predict on example X. So basically, as you said, if I'm in the dual, uh, it's not going to be that efficient when I have a lot of examples. 
I'm going to choose, if I have a lot of example, I'm going to probably choose to use the Riemann method. This has implications here too. So in one versus all, I have a lot of examples. Every classifier learns from a lot of examples, and I need to evaluate um, in this space. So here I have m examples. Here each classifier really uses m over k examples, or two times m over k examples. So uh, if I'm in the dual, basically it says I should prefer all versus all over one versus all. Even though a priori you would think that one versus all is more efficient. And it turns out that if you go to, uh, people have made, few people made this observation, if you go to, for example, the best SVM packages, LibSVM is the best SVM package, you will see that they indeed made these observations and when they run in the dual, their multi-class classifier is using the all versus all rather than the one versus all. And, and it's quite significant in terms of efficiency. Nevertheless, in the community, people don't always think about these things, and I think one versus all is the most commonly used uh, by far. But, but at least you know now that there are some issues, uh, and this Verona diagram that I plotted here represents uh, the fact that uh, there are some issues. So basically when we decompose a big problem into simple problems, which is what we've done here, sometimes uh, there are some issues. Yeah. Um, in principle, you could. The question is also how do you train these models, right? So, so in the one versus all, uh, you expect that all the examples that are not yellow in this picture uh, are separable from this yellow, and this may not happen. So, so really, the, the key impact is not so much in the decision, it's in how you train. And I'm going, to, I'm going to give another example. So there's a lot of stuff one can still say about it, and I'm not going to say a lot about it. I'm just going to give one more example. Um, uh, so there has been studied, and really uh, one way to think about this is that uh, if you have multi-class classification, you can always think about this architecture, right? So think about your features, the input at the bottom here and your labels at the top, uh, the stars. So irrespective of how you learned the weights, you can think about this network as a winner-take-all network or an argmax network, um, and I don't care how I learn the weights. So multiple ways of learning the weights could still be uh, supporting this kind of decision. So I can either do local learning. By local learning, I mean that I'm learning the weight vector for this guy here, irrespective of the others, which is what we've done before when we talked about one versus all, right? We basically learned a weight vector for green, irrespective of all the others. We just took the positive for green. We assume everything else is, is negative, and that's it. And we did that for each one of them. But I can also use the same architecture uh, to learn globally which I think this is kind of what you're hinting at. So what do I mean? Let, let me give an example. And, and really, this is the motivation, right? So the motivation is I don't want to learn a classifier for one label without taking into account the other classifiers. So one way to think about it in the case of Boolean classifier is to say, even though in the case of Boolean classifier, it's enough for me to just think about one node at the top, it would take two values positive or negative, I'm going to split it to two nodes, the node for the positives and the node for the negative. And I'm going to have now, because of that, two weight vectors rather than one, the positive weight vectors and the negative weight vectors. And the way I'm going to make decisions is I'm going to use the effective weight, which means uh, the difference between the positive weight vector, W plus, and the negative vector, W minus. So, uh, 
really my decision is going to be this way. If the dot product of x with the difference of the weight vectors is greater than theta, that, that's my decision. If this is different than y, update, otherwise don't update. And how do I update? When I update, I update both w plus for motion. I'm writing it here as if it's a we know uh, algorithm. And w minus, which I demote. So basically, what I've done here is I'm just learning about a Boolean classifier, but I'm learning it globally. So my W, my, my positive, my left star here, doesn't update its weight independently of this one. They update it together. Now, if you could generalize this to more than K, um, then you have a multi-class classifier that updates globally. And this is going to solve this Voronoi diagram example uh, that we have here. Um, so how do we do this? So we really need a global learning approach, and I'm going to explain this global learning approach in the context of support vector, vector machines that actually uh, their multi-class classification approach does that. Okay, so where are we here? So I just want to point out with this slide that I'm skipping a few things uh, that have to do with multi-class classification. The check marks are on the things that I'm talking about. Uh, there are slides at the bottom of this that I'm not talking about. You don't need to know. You can look at them. Um, uh, one of them is about error correcting code, which is another way of thinking about multi-class classifications. And the last bullet is constraint classification, which really is a justification for what I'm going to talk about in the context of multi-class uh, SVM. OK, so let's, let's remind ourselves of SVM. Uh, wasn't too long. So basically, uh, the key issue in, in uh, explaining support vector machines is that we care about the, mar the margin of the hyperplanes, the distance of, between, say, the hyperplane and the data point nearest to it. Um, and uh, we derive the classifier that maximizes this margin. Now, what happens if we have multi-class classification? It's not pluses or minuses anymore. We need to have a new notion for what is the margin in the multi-class case. Any suggestions? So it turns out, and actually this can be shown directly by reducing it to the binary case, that the right notion is to think about the distance, the gap between the true label and the second best label, right? So, so you're looking, you have a dot product between the W that corresponds to the label and X, and you're looking at the top one versus the second best. Uh, and this is going to be called the margin, and, and it can be shown to make sense. So now that we have this, we can actually generalize support vector machine to this, and as you'll see, this is really a global algorithm in the sense that it takes into account all the other labels when it updates W label, not only its own label. So again, let's, let's start with the binary SVM. We want to maximize the margin, and we show that maximizing the margin is equivalent to minimizing the norm of the weight vector while keeping the closest point to the hyperplane at a distance one. Uh, we're going to do the same thing for multi-class SVM. Uh, we're going to assume that each label has its own weight vector. We're going to maximize the, max, the multi-class margin. And uh, again, it's going to be equivalent to minimizing the total norm of the weight vectors while making sure that the true label is at least a distance one from the second best one. So this is where we generalize. So this is the formulation. So we have, in this case, we are maximizing, uh, we are minimizing this norm, right? This is the regularizer. Uh, subject to, and this is the difference, uh, 
dot product wy k x minus w k x is greater than one, um, and we're doing it for all i that are different than k. So basically, I want to be separated from all other labels. Uh, so the score of the true label is higher than the score of any other label uh, by one. So this is where we generalize. On the top left here, I put the binary SVN, so you'll see the difference. So now I'm summing over all my weight vectors, and the difference isn't uh, greater than one, but rather away by one from the other uh, weight vectors. Um, so that's, that's, the, that's the general case. Now we can move, that, that was the hard case, and now I can move to the general case, and as we did it before, I'm gonna do it by adding this slack variable, right? So not all the examples are gonna satisfy the margin constraints, and we're gonna add this to the regularizer. Uh, basically, we wanna keep this slack variable as small as possible, function as a function of the C the constant C, the trade off between the norm of W's and the select variable. So in this case, it's exactly the same as we had before, and I'm adding this select variable to, uh, and I wanna minimize this too. Um, so basically, that's, that's generalizing the support vector machine. This is the, the, the final formulation that we got. Um, the, the nice thing here is that if you notice, you don't learn each W separately. It's not like the standard one versus all learning, but rather you, you update the Ws as a function of the other Ws. You basically learn all of them together, which is some kind of a global learning approach. Um, okay, so there are many ways to train it, so I'm not going to, to get into how exactly to train it, but basically it's the same um, a gradient descent algorithm that we talked about before, only it's gonna be slightly more involved uh, because of the condition that we've added. Um, okay, so to summarize, we talked about training global SVM objectives. The prediction is still the same. It's a one versus all decisions. Um, notice that now we have a hypothesis space that is R, N, R to the NK. We have K vectors, each one of dimensionality NK. Uh, and we didn't explain why this works. So, but it's, it's easy to see, and in fact it's in the slides that I'm not gonna show, but you can look at. There is a justification that is very nice that explains why is this the right notion of a margin and why, therefore, this is the right algorithm to differentiate between the top scoring and the next top scoring. Um, so this is something that is called constraint classification. You can look at the next slides, uh, which you don't need questions on this. Yeah. I have a question just a few slides back on the W plus first W minus. Can you define what, what W plus and W minus are? So, Basically, I'm training now two classifiers. So given a positive example, I'm viewing it as positive for the left one and negative uh, to this. Given a negative example, I'm defining it as negative to this and positive to this. So basically, I'm taking the examples that I have and I'm training them, you think about it as training them twice, right? So. I'm, I have both the W plus and the W minus. I'm just keeping two weight vectors. Uh, this has two uh, roles. One is that I'm coupling uh, these two together. I'm not updating each one of them separately. That's the key role here. You can also think about it if you want, uh, if we want to go back to Wino. One limitation of Wino that we talked about is the fact that the weights are positive. And because the weights are positive, you cannot learn general Boolean functions. You can only learn monotone Boolean functions. We couldn't deal with negations. This generalization also allows Wino to 
to deal with the general Boolean function, because now uh, the difference here between W plus and W minus can be anything. But this is basically just a technical condition. I didn't have to do it, right? So I have just uh, binary classification. I could have one weight vector, and I'm just splitting it to two weight vectors. And I'm basically learning them as the negation of each other. But because I'm updating in this more involved way, they're, gonna, they're not going to end up being the negation of each other. But they're going to be dependent on each other. Um, other questions? OK. So, um, so let me move on to the next part, which we're going to start talking about generative models, probabilistic learning, naive base. I want to uh, start with some administrative things. One is projects. Uh, I want to talk with all the teams. So far, I talked with maybe about a third of you. So you have a chance to come Monday and Tuesday next week uh, and talk to me. I'm not going to assign slots. Just come randomly, choose, take a coin, flip it, and decide whether you're coming Monday or Tuesday. And that's going to split you pretty much to a half. Uh, so um, the, all the dates are already out. So poster will be presented in the last meeting of the class, which I think is December 9th. Uh, and we're going to start early. So I'm assuming that no one has classes before 10.30. It's too early. So we're going to start the poster session at 9. Uh, it's going to be here outside. We reserve this area. You're going to get poster board, so come early, put the posters, uh, and plan to spend the three hours explaining to the TAs and me and your other uh, and the other students what you've done. We're also going to ask you to prepare a short video uh, so that you'll basically uh, prepare and rehearse maybe the, the short uh, spiel that you have about it. The reports, though, are going to be due a lot later only in the final day of the exams, uh, which is the 19th. You can submit it earlier if you want, but that's, that's where the due date is. So, so I'm not going to assume that when you present the poster, everything is done. You could still have uh, some time to improve and, and, and you know, finish the projects. Um, I think that's it. Questions? OK, so, so where are we? So we, we spent all the time on something that we can call error-driven learning. Basically, um, we assume that someone gives data. The data was sampled from x cross y, um, and uh, which basically means we don't know how x's were generated. There is some distribution that governs the generation of the data. Once x came, there was some labeling process that labeled, labeled it, uh, and we were trying to hypothesize or learn a, a, a function y, which is f of x, uh, that approximate as best uh, this thing. So we assume that there is some distribution, but the distribution is unknown. Otherwise, there's no learning. Otherwise, you can just maximize the, the, the conditional probability if you know the distribution. Um, so we assume that there is a distribution. And in fact, we assume that the distribution that governs the generation of training data is the same one that is going to govern the generation of the test data. But we don't know a thing about the distribution. We're just trying to uh, find a hypothesis that minimizes some notion of error or loss. Um, so, uh, really, um, it's important to assume that the distribution is not known, but given that, there are really two basic approaches. The one that we've taken so far, which is direct learning or discriminative learning, and we can also think about another paradigm, uh, Bayesian learning or generative learning. Uh, and we'll see that there are 
actually making completely different assumptions, even though eventually you will see that technically they kind of merge. So, so as, a, as an example, let's take again the text correction problem that we've seen so far. Um, I saw the girl eat the park. Really, you want to correct it, do I saw the girl in the park? And the question is, how, do you gonna, how are you going to learn a model that, this, that decides that this it should be changed to in? Uh, so in the direct learning paradigms, we basically said, let's look at a lot of examples, a lot of sentences where a word is selected and is corrected. Uh, let's assume that we just care about it and in. So we take sentences that have it and have in, and the label is whether the in is correct or whether the it is correct. Uh, and the idea is that we look at a lot of examples, we discover regularities in the data, and then we come up with some prediction policy. It could be as simple as the rule that I have here. Uh, the it in rule is if the word the occurs before uh, or occurs after the target, make it an in. And this is an okay rule, probably not completely true, but let's assume that this is our hypothesis. Um, so uh, the assumptions that we've made in this paradigm came in the form of the hypothesis class. What kind of functions are we willing to learn? In this case, very simple functions, simple rules. Um, but the bottom line is that the function that we learned, this H, estimates the probability of the label given X. That's what we try to do. Uh, the second paradigm, and, and this is kind of how we did it, right? So we basically made some assumptions on how to drive this learning, various notions of errors. We call this loss. Uh, and there's also uh, all this theory came with a guarantee. The guarantee is that if we have an algorithm that is doing well on the training data, minimizes whatever loss you care about uh, on the observed data, then learning theory guarantees that it's going to behave well as a function of the size of the hypothesis space that you chose. So it's a very, very strong guarantee. Again, the assumptions are that the distribution that you've seen in training is the same distribution that you're going to see in test. And under this assumption, if you do well on training, you're going to do well in test, again, as a function of H. What's the second paradigm? So in this case, rather than correcting, uh, we are viewing the model the, the problem of text correction is that of generating correct sentences. So, and, and the goal is really to learn a model of language, not a corrector. Once we have a model of language, we can use it to predict. So, essentially, we're going to learn a probability distribution over all the sentences. Of course, in practice, we're going to make assumptions. We're going to make assumptions on the family of distributions that is possible, because otherwise the problem is going to be intractable. Uh, but once we learn a probability distribution over all sentences, we can use it to estimate which sentence is more likely. So really the question that we're going to ask is not directly about it and in, but rather whether the probability that I saw the girl eat the park is larger or smaller than I saw the girl in the park. And once we have a model that knows how to do this, we're going to derive from it a decision on how to correct or whether to correct the sentence. Um, as I said, in practice, uh, this is going to depend on assumptions. And we'll see as we go what are the assumptions. But the bottom line is that now we are really learning P of x, y. We also care about the x. And before, we didn't care about the x. And I'm factoring here P of x, y. Uh, P of x comma y to P of x given y times P of y. And this is important because we're going to play a lot with this uh, later on. So, so but, but here you can see why the model is called generative. Right? It really makes assumptions on how the data uh, x is generated given the label y. So sentences that have it 
are generated this way. Sentences that have in are generated this way. Uh, and then we're going to look at these uh, resulting sentences and compute their probabilities. So that's basically the model. Now, this also comes with guarantees, but the guarantees really have to do with the chosen probability distribution. If you know, if you guess right, the probability distribution that governs the generation of the data, what we're going to do here is the optimal thing. In reality, we're going to assume a family of distributions, use the data to choose a specific member of this family, because we cannot assume that everything is possible. Um, and if we, as again, if we assume the right, what we're going to do is going to be the right thing. Uh, okay, so before we get to details, um, I want to I wanna make kind of a side comment that sometimes is confusing. Really, there are two, two different notions when you talk about probabilistic learning. One is that of learning probabilistic concepts. What is a probabilistic concept? It's a function from x to 0, 1. So essentially, you assign a probability to an instance. Uh, if you assign a number between 0 and 1, you can interpret it as probability. Sometimes you can show that really this is a probability distribution. And this is not new. Because everything we've said before about binary classification, you know that your model actually output a number between 0 and 1, or could be made to output a number between 0 and 1. Everything we said before applies. Uh, even the VC dimension theory that we sold as uh, something that applies to real-valued numbers can be extended to apply to real-valued numbers, not only binary. Um, so, so that's one. So basically, nothing new about learning probabilistic concepts. The second notion is that of Bayesian learning, where really we're using probabilistic criteria as a way to select the hypothesis. Um, so the hypothesis could be deterministic, could be a Boolean function, or could be uh, other functions. Could be automata, could be a graph, could be whatever you want. So really, it's not, the, it's not what you learn, it's how you learn. This is the difference between what we've done so far and what we're going to do in the next uh, couple of weeks. Uh, and really, as we'll see, these things are going to merge a little bit because we're going to use the same principles and we'll be able to map stuff that we've done before uh, to stuff that we're going to do here. OK. Um, so now, we are going to play a little bit with probability theory. Uh, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time, I'm assuming that you've all seen that. Uh, remind yourself of basic probability. There are a few slides that I'm going to skip now in this, in this uh, slide deck that will serve to remind you of the key notions in probability theory. You can go over it. You can go over your textbook from your classes. Uh, choose whatever you want. But uh, I'm going to try to skip this. Oh, I did. OK. Uh, but there are a few slides there as a reminder. So what are in this, what's in these slides? Basically, a few notions uh, that I'm summarizing here. Product rule, this is something that you should all know. Uh, we're going to see this a lot. P of A, B can be written also for events A and B could be written as P of A given B times P of B or P of B given A times P of A. Uh, the notion of independence is really important. Uh, the sum rule, Bayes rule, which is basically another way of writing um, uh, the product rule, is going to be very important. This is going to be the basic tool that we're going to play with. You have to understand total probability, basically how to write uh, P of an event, P of B, as a function of uh, decomposing it to uh, P of B and AI, sum of AI, sum over I's where AI's are disjoint. 
and you can also do the same thing for conditional probabilities. So, so all these are things that you've seen. If you don't remember, just remind yourself uh, of this. We're going to play with all these things. Uh, just as an example of something that you might have seen, you might have not seen, but you might have not thought about it as an application of this basic probability, here's a puzzle. Monty Hall problem. Who haven't seen it? Who hasn't seen it? Everyone saw it. Okay, so you can, you, you'll tell me the answer. So suppose you're in a game show, that's the game. Uh, you're given a choice of three doors. One, two, three. Uh, behind one of them is a car, say. Uh, you pick a door, say you pick number one, and the host who knows what's behind the door opens another door. Say they open door number three. And now you're given a choice uh, to change your decision. Uh, you can move to door two if you want. Uh, should you move to door two? Yes, no? Yes. Why yes? So everyone agrees that this is yes? Or someone wants to stay with one? Why is yes? Uh, the likelihood that it's behind door two is two thirds. Okay, so can you give a more detailed explanation? Right, so, so the key issue here is that the host knows what's behind the doors, and they can always choose and, and open a door where the car is not there, right? So, so then the way to think about it is exactly this, you know, there was a third probability that you chose right from the beginning. With this probability, you don't want to change. With the rest, you want to change. Now. The reason I mentioned this exercise here uh, is not only because it's kind of fun to think about, and sometimes, if you haven't seen it before, counterintuitive, uh, because you can use this slide to justify to yourself why this is the right thing to do, and this could be a good exercise. Okay, so, so what are we doing here? We're playing with Bayes' rule. This is uh, Thomas Bayes uh, that basically the stuff that he's done underlies everything we're going to do here. Um, and, and specifically, what we're going to do here is we're going to use this most important formula in probabilistic machine learning, the formula that says that the probability of A given B can also be written as the probability of B given A times B of A divided by P of B. Uh, very easy to prove. You know the product rule. Uh, it's it's uh, completely equivalent to the product rule. We are going to use it in a very specific context, uh, which is this. We're going to think about, instead of A and B, we're going to think about the hypothesis and evidence or observations, examples, data. And we're going to say that the probability of the hypothesis, given the evidence, can be written as the probability of the evidence given the hypothesis times the probability of the hypothesis divided by that of the evidence. So let's break this down a little bit. So, so really the goal of what we are going to do here is to find the best hypothesis from some hypothesis space given data, evidence. Um, so what is best? Best is going to be here most probable. Uh, and in order to do this, we need to make some assumptions. Right? We need to assume a probability distribution over uh, the hypothesis. In addition, we need to know something about the relation between what we observe and the hypothesis. Right? So think about the case where you have a coin, uh, and you want to uh, say something about whether this is a fair coin, or not, and how biased it is. You need to be able to relate outcomes of your experiment. You're going to toss the coin a few times, relate these observations to a probability distribution. Uh, and once we do this, uh, we can use uh, Bayes' rule 
um, in order to derive things. So, so essentially, everything we're going to do here is going to be applications of base rule. We're going to show that you can apply it to many things. You can use it to choose a hypothesis, or you can use it to choose parameters uh, of, of a hypothesis uh, or of a model. And we're going to do everything based on, on the same kind of principle. So, so the, what are the components of, of uh, what we're talking about? So uh, we really need to uh, talk about these four components. P of H is going to be the prior distribution over the hypothesis H. So we have a lot of hypotheses to choose from. Let's assume that we have some prior distribution over these. Really, it's background knowledge. Before we observe any data, what do you think uh, about the possible hypothesis? If you have no information, we're going to assume uniform distribution. Uh, P of D is the probability of the data, the evidence. Uh, the probability that this example of the data is observed. This has nothing to do with the hypothesis. Right? If you're very likely to see this data anyhow, irrespective of which hypothesis governs the generation of the data, then uh, it's going to reduce the probability of the hypothesis. P of D given H is the probability of observing this data item given that the hypothesis is H. P of H given D is the probability, is the posterior probability. This is really what we care about if we want to make predictions, right? We want to know which is the right hypothesis given the data. Uh, so now that we have these components, we can write base rule in terms of this. So P of H given D, which is the posterior, that's what we care about, can be written as P of D given H times P of H divided by P of D. And if you think a little bit about it, it should make sense to you, right? So, so P of H given D should increase with P of H, right? If you have more probable hypotheses, then it should also be uh, higher posterior. It should go up with P of D given H. If the data is more likely given this hypothesis, the hypothesis is more likely. And it should decrease with P of D. Right? So if the data has high probability to occur anyhow, it's not going to push toward this specific hypothesis or that specific hypothesis. It's just likely uh, to happen anyhow. So, so that's really all there is. Um, uh, now, the scenario is this. Just like before, you have a collection of hypotheses. Think about them as models, if you want. But as we'll see, it will also be a set of parameters to choose from. And we attempt to find the most probable H in capital H, given the observed data. So this uh, maximally probable hypothesis is called maximum a posteriori hypothesis, or MAP. Uh, and this is how we compute it. We basically do argmax over all Hs of P of HD. Now I'm substituting using Bayes' rule instead of P of HD this. And now you notice that I actually don't care about the denominator. P of D doesn't matter because I'm maximizing here over all H's in H. So really, I care about argmax of P of D given H times P of H. So that's, that's basically it. We're done with base learning. The rest is just instantiating this rule uh, with different probabilistic models. Uh, and that's what we're going to do in the next you know, week also, or maybe two weeks. Um, OK, so, so a few other uh, notations and terminology, right? So uh, basically, we, we define something that we called uh, maximum a posteriori. In many situations, we have no prior knowledge. So all the hypotheses are equally likely. Uh, in this case, I actually don't care also about P of H up there, right? Because all the P of H's are the same. So when I'm doing argmax over P of H over all H's, this does not matter. In this case, 
really what I get is that I should do argmax over p of d given h. Uh, and this is going to be called the maximum likelihood hypothesis. Um, so basically, we're just looking for the hypothesis that best explains the data. P of d given h, p, p of h given d, uh, is going to be chosen by looking at p of d given h and choosing the, that one that, uh, that maximizes this, choosing the h that maximizes this. So let's start with some examples. So um, questions so far? Notations, anything? OK, so uh, let's take an example. So a coin. Uh, I, have a, I have a coin, and I want to know whether it's fair or 60% biased toward head. So this is the learning problem, right? So I have two hypotheses in this case. Hypothesis one, probability of head is 0.5. Hypothesis two, probability of head is 0.6. And I have to choose. Uh, how do I choose? Well, I want to observe data, so I'm going to toss the coin. So I toss, so these are my two hypotheses. P of H is uh, uh, 0.5. I'm loading H here. Uh, in this case, it's head. Uh, 0.5 and 0.6. So I'm also assuming some priors. So I'm assuming that H1, which is the hypothesis of the coin is fair, is 0.75. And 0.25 is the prior probability of the coin is biased 0.6, 0 0.4. Uh, now I'm tossing the coin uh, for my first uh, data collection. Uh, what I got is head. So, so let's just go over the different components of what Bayes' theory wants. So we want to compute P of D given H. P of D given H1, as we said, is 0.5. So this is where the observation are linked to my probabilistic assumption. Uh, P of D given H1 is 0.5. Everyone agrees? P of D given, P of the data the probability, we can read it, the probability that I observe had, given that my hypothesis is H2, is 0.6. Um, what's the probability of the data? What's the probability of observing uh, head? So the probability of observing head is the probability of observing head, given that the hypothesis was H1, plus the probability that it was H2. So it's P of D given H1 times P of H1 plus probability of D given H2 times P of H2. <coughs> if you do the math, the probability of observing uh, this specific data is 0.525. Okay? Notice that the reason I got this is because I have this specific hypothesis space. Right? the 0.5 or the 0.6 um, hypothesis with these specific priors. Everything matters here, right? That's the reason, that's the probability of observing head in, in one coin toss, yes. So is D always one example or is it the set of examples? No, no, so this is, this is my data set. They gave me in the data set one example. In the next slide, they're gonna give me a different data set. So, so my data set is one example, the simplest uh, case possible. Okay, so now that I have, okay, again, so, so I did P of D given A. Remember that we had four components, and just kind of, the first one was the prior, P of H. The second one, come on. The second one is P of D given H, which we computed. It's basically how we relate data to hypotheses. The third one was P of D. And the last one that we care about is P of H given D, how to choose the hypothesis. And here I need to compute it twice. I have two hypotheses, so I have to compute P of H1 given the data, P of H2 given the data, and then do the argmax. And again, how do I compute? Here I'm using Bayes' rule. So P of H1 given D 
is P of D given H1, P of H1 divided by P of D. If you do the math, you get something like this. Same thing for P of H2. Now, you know already that I didn't have to compute P of D if all I want is to choose the most likely hypothesis. But anyhow, just to do everything completely, you can see now that you're going to choose H1, uh, which means you think that the, hypothesis, that the coin is fair, even though the probability of this being the fair, a fair coin is now lower than the prior, which makes sense, right? Because you got head, and H2 has higher probability for head. So it makes sense that you are below the prior. OK, so, uh, so after the first coin toss, we still think that the coin is more likely to be fair, just like the prior thought. But we, we think less strongly uh, that it's likely to be fair. So notice that if we were to use the maximum likelihood approach rather than the maximum posteriori, that is, we would have a prior that is uniform, uh, we would think otherwise. Because we got head, which means it favors H2, the bias coin. So if you do the same math for, uh, with uniform prior, you will get something else. And you can try it as an exercise. The next exercise is try 100 coin tosses, a different data set, right? So my first data set was one example. The second data set is uh, 100 coin tosses, and I got 70 uh, heads. So you can do, you can do this math. Um, and I think that you would agree with me, just by looking at these numbers, even before you do the math, that you will believe that the coin is biased now, right? Because you got 70 out of 100 that are ahead. And you can indeed do the math. It's written here. Uh, again, case of 100 coin tosses. Uh, the only thing you have to make sure is that we know that these are independent coin tosses. Uh, that's the, the, the only thing you should care about. And therefore, the probability, when I'm computing the probability of the data, for example, uh, it's P of D given H1 times P of H1. Again, plus P of D given H2 times P of H2. And the probability of D given H1 is 0.5 to 100, because these are 100 independent coin tosses. And the same thing for the 0.6, uh, and so on. So, um, do the math, and you'll see that what you get now is that you believe that it's H2 with very, very high uh, confidence. 99%, it's, it must be H2. So again, you, you can do this. So, so what have we done? Basically, we solved the learning problem. We solved the learning problem in a very, very simple case. Two hypotheses we computed using Bayes' rule P of H1 given the data, P of H2 given the data, we did argmax, everything is, is solved. Now, in reality, though, that's not going to be the case. It's not that you're going to get two choices or seven choices. Yes? OK, good question. So wh why are you thinking that? No, but I do know. OK, so that's a good question. So do I need 70 choose 100, 100 choose 70 as a coefficient here? And the answer is no. I mean, it's a good thought. But really, I already saw the tosses, right? I observed this specific data. So it's one instance, OK? So I don't need to consider the choices that I could have had. But it's good to think about this, yes? So if the data was given to you in an online fashion, then you would probably need that uh, What do you mean in an online fashion? So if you were toss, uh, tossing the coin one by one, the order would matter, right? But then I will not know that it's 70. So I would need to think about a slightly different model. Right? 
uh, unless I don't understand uh, the, what you have in mind. We tossed the coin 100 times and we got heads on the first, 25th, 26th, 27th, that sort of price. Yes. In that case, you need the 100 choose 70, I think. Why? Because in that, there's an ordering between the data points you have. Yeah, but I already know this is a specific instance, right? So, so w what is the role of the 100 choose 70 here? Is to compute the probability that some 70 out of the 100 will be had. But I'm not in this situation. I know these are the 70 that are, that are chosen. So I don't need to consider all these options. But there could be cases where this is the case, but, but not here. Because here I just saw the 70 and I know which they are. Okay, so that, that's actually an important thing to think about. But I want to I wanna leave us with, with another uh, thought which is, um, that, that's a very trivial case. In real life, I'm going to give you a coin. I don't have a coin here. Uh, but you don't know that it's a fair coin or a 0.6 coin. You have infinitely many possibilities for P, the probability of head. So how do we do it? Right? So, so the problem really is not uh, to choose one of two, but rather, in many realistic cases, to choose out one of infinitely many hypotheses or infinitely many parameter choices for a model. So here is the problem. Assume that you toss P1 minus P coin. You toss it M times. You get K heads, M minus K tails. What is P? So what is P? K over M. You guess K over M. Why? It's uh, the observed, <coughs> observed distribution thing. It's the likely distribution. It's an empirical result. Yes. So I, I think it's a quarter, actually. Why, why, why is your choice better than mine? Yeah? More likely. More likely. What does it mean? P's not a value. P's a distribution of the values. Between zero and one. Yeah, it's just, um, you also say out of the data that you've seen, say if you throw the coin 100 times and you get 70 heads, it's most likely out of the data that you've seen that then the P is quite Right. So, so that's exactly the argument we need. So, so we are playing now with Bayes' rule. We are making decisions using the maximum likelihood principle. And what we want is to show that indeed, you're right, m over k, given the SU model that I didn't actually make ex, uh, explicit, binomial distribution, is the right choice. But the way to do it is basically to use Bayes' rule that we've talked about last uh, just a few slides ago, and prove that m over k is the right choice rather than my choice of a quarter. K Yours is going to be k over, k over m, sorry, uh, is the right choice rather than any other numbers. Uh, the, the technical difficulty here is that unlike the previous slide where we had two options, we can compute p of h1 given the data, p of h2 given the data, and compare them. Now we have infinitely many. So we're going to resort to a little bit of calculus in order to figure out that, yes, m over k is the right solution under the binomial model. So that's what we're going to start next time. Final questions? Yeah? Oh, so, so, uh, okay, so my notation here is that this is head. The probability of head, uh, so, so H1 is my hypothesis, and my H1 hypothesis is that the probability of getting head when I'm tossing a coin is 0.5. And now this H1 is, could be right or wrong. It could be H1, it could be H2, and the probability of H1 here, 
is my prior assumption that H1 is correct. I'm assuming that uh, it's 0.75 this type of coin and 0.25 this type of coin. Okay, so, so assume two coins. One of them is a fair coin. The probability of head is 0.5. Another one is a bias coin. The probability of head, of getting head when you toss it is 0.6. So these are two hypotheses. And now, I don't know which coin I have. I'm assuming that it's 75% that I have this coin and 25% that I have this coin. This is the P of lowercase h1, lowercase h2. OK? Yeah. So could you think of P of lowercase h as essentially you have a bag of 10 or 100 coins, and you, you, you know, you're blind, you finally reach in, and, and there's, a, there's 75 fair coins. Yeah. So we, we are assuming the frequencies model of probability. There's a lot of philosophical debates on whether this is the right way to think about probabilities. But yeah, this is a good way to think about it. So I have a bag of 100 coins. 75 of them are biased, are, are fair, sorry. I, I think that 75 of them are fair and 25 of them are biased. And therefore, if I choose a coin there uh, with probability 0.75, it's going to come up a fair coin with probability of head 0.5. With, prob with probability 0.25, it's going to be the other one. But I might be wrong, and therefore I'm going to do the experiment. And when I do the experiment, I realize actually that I was wrong. My prior on how many coins of each type were in the bag wasn't right. OK? I, I took a, a coin, and I tossed it, and it turns out that I wasn't right about 75, 25 in the bag. That, that's one interpretation of what we've done. Yeah. So by the end of this, is it that you're trying to learn what is the exact P of H1 and P of H2? Yeah, I'm, I'm calling it now P of H1 given the data, right? So that's what I want to know. I want to know what is the real hypothesis here. And in the end, whichever is the highest probability, we choose that hypothesis. Yes. I, it has to be one of these two, right? So, so based on this experiment, what I have in my hand is really H2, OK? Even though it's just 0.9943, but that's what I have in my hand. OK, so that's actually a very good way to think about it. And as I said, in reality, it's not going to be just two coins, because I don't know that one of them, that some of them are 0.6 and some of them are fair. I just get a coin. Uh, and I want to estimate which is the P. So that's what we're going to start with next time. Okay, have a good weekend. Understand is right. Uh, I want to uh, like test uh, my understanding of your uh, slides is right. Like, uh, yeah. if you toss the coin a uh, hundred times and you've got like seven, uh, 70 heads and uh, 30 tails uh, for the, uh, the, the H1, so you're assuming that uh, this is uh, uh, 0.5 to 0.5, so uh, it's like uh, 0.5 to 100 times uh, to, uh, 0.75. Uh, just so me, back, back in your slides, like, uh, uh, so, like, when I toss the coin a hundred yeah. times and there's uh, 70 heads and 30 yeah. details, and uh, the, the first term in that uh, equation uh, in your slides uh, is like a 0.5 to 100 times uh, 0.75. To, yeah, point yeah. five to the power because yeah, because uh, so so that should uh, really should be like point five to the power of uh, seventy times times point five, five to the times yeah. yeah yeah that's the right way to write it yeah yeah. The hypothesis in generative models and discriminative models is the same, but so is there not some? 
Well, yes and no. So, so in the sense that, um, so, so it's a class of functions in both cases, and you assume that your hypothesis comes from this class of functions. Typically, the, we represent the function differently, right? So typically, in generative cases, the assumption is a class of probability distribution. You're going to say, okay, so I have probability distribution that uh, makes these independent assumptions, and in discriminative learning, you think about it as a class of functions rather than probability distribution. Yeah, so is it fair to say that the assumptions in uh, generative models are stronger than those in distribution? Because in generative, you also make an assumption that uh, your data would be coming from a distribution, which I'm going to hypothesize. Uh, but, but actually, you, you are, uh, I, I actually, I think, yes. Although you typically don't assume a distribution, you assume a plan family of distribution. Yeah, I mean, but at the end, when I actually make a model, I would have some sort of a bias towards some particular sort of distribution. Yeah, definitely, fine. And essentially, all Bayesian learning does really is, uh, you, you, it's a parameterized learning, mm -hmm. right? So, and you choose the set of parameters that define the distribution exactly. So say if it's a naive-based algorithm, you know this is the form of the model, and you have to learn n plus one or n minus one or whatever parameter, and that's it. And now, after you've done it, that's the generative model. Yeah, so, so in this sense, I, I don't know if we can say more restrictive or less restrictive. It's slightly different angle uh, on this, but it's very, very similar in the sense that you really, your ability to learn depends on making some strong assumptions on where is the data coming from? Yeah, so, which is not there in the discriminative case. So somehow it just feels like... No, no, but in discriminative also, right? So, um, okay, so in discriminative you can say, I'm not going to assume where it's coming from, but I'm going to assume a hypothesis phase to learn into. Yes. yes. Right? And, uh, but without this, you cannot learn. Yeah. So, so that's the difference, oh, okay. right? So in this case, you're, you're making the assumption on the X. Hmm. And here you're making the assumption, oh, the let's call it on the, on the Y or on the mapping, yeah. But in both cases, you are assuming some st restrictions, mm -hmm. otherwise the process is not gonna work. Also, when you say the converge at the end, I'm not, so do they actually give similar information for some pattern? Yeah, yeah, so, so, so you will, we will see that, you know, say logistic regression is a relaxation oh, of naive base, right? So, so you can start from both directions and get to the same thing. Right, so uh, so that that's basically going to be one of the one of the conclusions next week or something like that. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, question? Uh, yeah, quick question on the homework. I was wondering if it was something complicated or a quick fix uh, that I keep running out of memory in my GPU. I don't know if it's a quick fix, but because um, there's no way I'm storing like 15 gigabytes. No, 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 you shouldn't. Um, I don't know why you got you got that. You you basically your best bet is to try to play with it or get some help from the PA to play with it. Oh. Yeah, I, I don't know. But actually, I've seen it. I heard from the PA that other students have the same problem. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So so they may already.